The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Bridging to Transplant, Pediatric Heart Failure and Ventricular Assist Devices. We're glad that you're joining us today. My name is Gina Petty, and I'm the Director of Family Support and Outreach at the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. We're glad to be partnering with transplant families on our webinar today in support of National Pediatric Transplant Week. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. If at any point during the presentation you need technical assistance, please type your concern in the chat window. If you have any audio issues, you should be able to switch between using your computer speakers and a phone if you need to. In order to provide high quality session today and avoid any background noises, all attendees are in listen only mode. Your questions are encouraged and welcome during the presentation. You can submit your questions uh, via the question box, which is located on your webinar control panel. We'll be taking questions at the conclusion of the talk. Now, I'd like to introduce Melissa McLean, who is the founder and executive director of Transplant Families. Thanks so much for your partnership and welcome, Melissa. Hi, Gina, and thank you so much for the introduction. Transplant Families was founded in the hope to support, educate, and inspire pediatric transplant families for all solid organ and bone marrow transplants. We are so happy to celebrate this second National Pediatric Transplant Week in collaboration with Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. Proud to work with Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation, Action, and all the support organizations, hospitals, medical professionals, and many others that make pediatric transplant a much easier journey. Every day after transplant is truly a gift for us, and we thank you for that. It is now my privilege to introduce Dr. Peng, who is currently the Medical Director of Pediatric Heart Failure and Mechanical Circulatory Support at the University of Michigan Congenital Heart Center. He obtained his MD from the University of California, San Francisco, and received his general pediatrics training from the University of Washington, Seattle Children's Hospital. He then went on to Stanford University for his pediatric cardiology and heart failure transplant fellowships. His academic interests include outcomes, research, quality improvement, collaborative learning, and novel device investigations. Although he lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan with his wife and two sons, five and seven years old, he still fervently roots for his Bay Area hometown sports teams. Without further ado, welcome Dr. Ping. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I want to sincerely thank everyone at the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation and Transplant Families for providing this incredible opportunity to meet with you all. It is truly an honor and privilege. I am presenting on behalf of ACTION and the University of Michigan Congenital Heart Center. ACTION has received funding support from Abbott, Berlin Heart, and Medtronic. In a recent analysis, we discovered that for children with cardiomyopathy, transplant-free survival has improved over time. Remarkably, mortality has decreased by 50% in the current era. This progress is most likely due to improved awareness and recognition of disease, in part due to efforts from groups such as the CCF, improved medical management, and growing pediatric heart failure expertise. Still, even with this improvement, currently one in three children diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy will require transplantation or die from their condition. Children with other forms of cardiomyopathy and heart failure due to congenital heart disease face even steeper odds. As parents, I believe it is important for you to recognize some nonspecific symptoms that may reflect a weakening heart and worsening heart failure, including poor growth or too much weight gain, poor appetite, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, decreased energy and play, and a strong preference for sedentary activities, shortness of breath, labored fast breathing, cough, and sometimes kids with heart failure can be misdiagnosed with asthma for years since asthma is much, much more common and likely than pediatric heart failure. Difficulties with sleep, for example, needing to be propped up with a couple pillows or waking up frequently at night. Chest pain, palpitations, passing out can all be red flags. For children with severe refractory heart failure, 
heart transplantation is often the best treatment option. But with more children surviving with heart disease, heart transplant waiting lists and waiting times are getting longer. Currently in the United States, nearly 400 children are waiting for a heart. There is growing mismatch between the number of children needing hearts and the number of available donors. Most children must wait months to years for the right match, and some do not survive this waiting period. Dr. Lynn Warner Stevenson, a pioneering heart transplant doctor, once said that a heart transplant is the answer to heart failure the way the lottery is the answer to poverty. There has to be a better answer. Until fairly recently, we did not have many support options for children in progressively worsening heart failure on the waiting list. We could put them on a mechanical ventilator, paralyze them, and in the most dire situations, place them onto ECMO, which is a large and perilous heart-lung bypass machine. Not surprisingly, these were not good longer-term strategies, and patients that needed them often became too sick to survive to and through transplantation. Fortunately, over the past decade, our field has been revolutionized by a newer way to support kids with severe heart failure called the VAD. A VAD is a, a ventricular assist device. They are referred to as, also referred to as mechanical circulatory support, heart pumps, and other names. An LVAD is a VAD that supports the left ventricle. An RVAD is for the right ventricle. BIVAD stands for a device or devices that support both sides of the heart. Simply put, a VAD is a surgically implanted pump that can help a weak heart circulate blood better. Just like our kids do, VADs come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Unlike, unlike the adult world, the pediatric field is not one VAD fits all. For bigger kids, we can actually use VADs designed for adults, which have become smaller over time. These are fully implantable devices that fit in and around the heart. The pump is typically placed into the ventricle and a tube goes from the pump to the patient's aorta. A power cord, also known as a drive line, exits the body and skin and is connected to a controller and batteries that need to be worn. These VADs are centrifugal or continuously spinning pumps that suck blood from the weak heart, spin, and then propel blood forward into the aorta and out to the entire body. There are two commonly used types of continuous flow pumps, the HVAD, the hardware HVAD, and the HeartMate 3. The decision on which to use depends on the size of the patient and each center's preference and experience. If things go well, patients may be discharged home with these devices. However, these VADs cannot fit into our smaller patients. Thus, for our smaller patients, their VADs must sit outside the body and be connected to the heart by clear tubes called cannulas. The most commonly used VAD for small patients is the Berlin Heart x -Core. You can see the small pump connected to our adorable patient, which is connected to a large driver. This video shows how the pump blood is pumped in a pulsatile fashion by air that is pumped in and out behind this gray membrane. The PDMAG or Centromag is another option for smaller patients. Using the same technology as the HeartMate 3, the centrifugal pump sits outside the body and is connected to the heart via plastic tubes or cannulas. With these pumps that sit outside the body, children do need to remain in the hospital until transplant. The Jarvik 2015 is an implantable, miniaturized, continuous pump that is currently undergoing clinical trials and has been implanted experimentally 
by, in a handful of children across the world. The jury is still out on whether the pump is safer than our currently accessible options. So why do we use VADs? Our goals are to support kids until they can be transplanted. A much smaller percentage are on VADs indefinitely as chronic long-term therapy. And a few patients may recover good function on a VAD and be eligible for VAD explantation or removal. Our goal is to improve survival and quality of life. With our VADs, we want to alleviate heart failure symptom, symptoms. We want our children to grow, develop, and rehabilitate on a VAD in a way they wouldn't be able to in decompensated heart failure. And we want to make our patients as strong as they can be for transplant. We might consider implanting a VAD in patients with severe progressive heart failure and persistent symptoms, poor feeding and growth, and or other organ dysfunction despite being on strong continuous IV medications such as milrinone. The decision to use a VAD is complex and ideally should include a thorough multidisciplinary evaluation as a heart transplant evaluation does, if time allows. And early consideration is important to avoid severely decompensated heart failure, other organ failure, and or ECMO, which are clearly associated with decreased survival. In survival curves such as this one, flatter lines equate to better survival. The blue line represents the patients that are in severely decompensated heart failure before they're bad. You can clearly see that their survival is worse. So we know waiting times are getting longer. What can we do to get more kids safely to transplant? Research shows that children with heart failure supported with a VAD are actually more likely to survive to heart transplant compared to those without a VAD. VADs are actually one of the most protective factors against waiting list mortality. And about 50% of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy are being bridged to transplant with a VAD in the current era. And despite being sicker prior to VAD, children with VADs go on to have outstanding post heart transplant survival that is equal to those of children who did not get a VAD. You can see in this graph that there is absolutely no difference in survival between these two groups. This suggests that VADs have ability to mitigate risks associated with end-stage heart failure. Also, the same paper showed that patients who have had VADs do not seem to have any more complications after transplant compared to non-VAD patients. In bigger kids, survival with adult implantable VADs is outstanding, as represented by the green curve. In smaller patients, however, the pumps that sit outside the body are associated with much higher risk, as represented by the blue and red lines. Nevertheless, these devices are still better than the limited options that existed before VADs were available. Clearly, VADs have improved outcomes, but they are far from a perfect therapy, and there is considerable room for improvement. On a VAD, most children will experience an adverse event at some point. Most of these are treatable, but serious complica complications can and do occur. I will now briefly touch on some of these potential complications. So clots can form in and around these heart pumps and can be ejected out, potentially causing a stroke. 10 to 20% of kids will experience a stroke of varying degrees on a VAD. The clots can also become large enough that the pump stops working properly. This is called pump thrombosis. Sometimes this requires a surgical pump replacement. To prevent clots, we place kids on anticoagulation or quote unquote blood thinners like Coumadin, which can put them at increased risk for bleeding. 
Many will require a transfusion at some point during their course. And because uh, the components exiting the skin and the artificial material within the body, you can imagine that patients are at increased risk for infection. About one in three patients will be treated with antibiotics for a VAD associated infection. Also, most patients receive LVADs. With LVADs, the right side of the heart is unprotected. About 25% of pediatric patients will continue to need at least IV medications to support the right heart long term. In rare instances, patients may requ require an additional RVAD placement. There are other burdens that go along with life with a VAD. These include daily medication needs, such as anticoagulation, antiplatelet therapy, diuretics, blood pressure medications. There are frequent dressing changes and lab draws, discomfort with the device, anxiety, always being tethered to equipment, and in some instances, the need to remain hospitalized. And overall, pediatric heart failure and VAD care is clearly a daunting, formidable problem. Given the small number of patients that we see and extreme complexity in this field, no single center can fully conquer this problem completely on their own. In order to get better, faster, we need to join forces with our colleagues, some of which are giants in the field, to co collaborate and share best practices. The Children's Oncology Group is the gold standard for the power of collaboration and standardization. Because of their commitment to collaboration, childhood leukemia, which was previously a nearly fatal diagnosis, now has long-term survival greater than 90%. Similarly, the National Pediatric Cardiology Quality Improvement Collaborative, NBCQIC, is another shining example of the power of collaboration. Patients, families, clinicians, and researchers have come together to transparently share best practices. Incredibly, in just a few short years, they have been able to decrease interstage mortality in hypoplastic left heart syndrome by 50%. Recently, leaders from Cincinnati, Stanford, Boston, and other centers also realized that collaboration and not competition was necessary to make the next breakthroughs in pediatric heart failure and bad care. Thus, we came together to form action. Action's mission is to improve critical outcomes for children and adult congenital heart disease patients with heart failure by developing an international collaborative learning health system that unites all key stakeholders, patients, families, clinicians, researchers, and industry. What is a learning health system? And how is it different from traditional healthcare delivery? A learning health system continuously learns and improves, is inclusive and collaborative, and has patients, families, researchers, industry, and clinicians from different subspecialties all working together, all with a seat at the table. It generates and applies new knowledge to improve practice quickly and constantly reassesses outcomes and tests new ideas and is nimble and willing to change. Action's philosophy can be summed up by two phrases, all teach, all learn. Essentially, every stakeholder has some knowledge or expertise that can be useful. And share seamlessly, steal shamelessly. Everyone in Action really shares and uses each other's resources and expertise. And yes, in case you were wondering, we absolutely stole these two phrases from other collaboratives without any shame. In two short years, we have shown, we have grown to include over 30 centers throughout North America, and we have partnerships with centers in Australia, Europe, and Asia. We unanimously decided that our first priority should be to decrease the risk of stroke in children with VADs. We met early and often to brainstorm why kids might be getting strokes and how best to prevent them. 
In December, we excitedly rolled out our first formal quality improvement intervention, the ABCs of stroke prevention. Amazingly, nearly 30 centers all came together and agreed upon a standardized uniform approach to anticoagulation and blood pressure management. We also created a concise checklist that is now being read during rounds across the country to make sure our goals are clearly communicated each and every day. This way, all providers, nurses, patients, families, and others are on the same page every day. And we are not saying we have all the right answers, but if we all start doing the same thing, we can finally begin to figure out what the right answers are. And looking at very early raw data, it does seem like we are already making a difference. Our baseline network uh, stroke rate was approximately 15% for children on VADS. And this is in line with historical data. However, since our interventions rolled out in December, we have only had one stroke reported. And in true learning health system fashion, we are already launching our next quality improvement initiative, D for discharge. In recent research, we realize only about half of the eligible children with BADS are discharged currently. We believe part of this is due to practice variation and lack of experience across pediatric centers that are not doing many VADs per year. By sharing best practices and standardizing care, we know we can get more kids safely home and even back at school with their VADs and improve their quality of life. And we have a long list of other projects that we are actively working on to improve care throughout the network. If you squint, you can see that we are very interested in patient parent focused projects, including learning more about patient reported outcomes, patient family stress, parent advocacy, and we are trying to build a network to connect and support patients and families with pediatric heart failure and VADs but we, we need your help to get these done. We have also joined forces with four other important pediatric car cardiology learning networks, including MPC QIC, to form a network of networks called Cardiac Networks United, so that we can all share data and resources to improve outcomes together and not on our, in our own little silos. Action has seen early success because we are a spirited team full of energetic, talented, selfless, generous, and fun members, all dedicating uh, their life's work to improving pediatric heart failure outcomes. Nevertheless, we need many more parent leaders and members to fulfill our mission. We need to hear your voices, experiences, concerns, and lessons in order to get better. So how can you get involved? How can we improve critical outcomes in pediatric heart failure together? Please follow and interact with us on Twitter at Action4HF. Also find us on Facebook, Action Network Families. Join Action formally. Our website is here and you can email us for, uh, for more information on how to join. We need you to collaborate on quality improvement projects with us and spearhead parent and patient uh, initiatives. We, we want you to be or find a parent mentor, family member uh, mentor or patient mentor through action. We want uh, parents to share family stories through action and to spread the word about what we are doing. And I expect action to move into the top five list of most followed after this webinar. So in summary, VADs have significantly improved survival in pediatric heart failure. However, 
Mortality and adverse events remain unacceptably high, especially for smaller children. Through collaboration and standardization within action, we will get better. But we need you to make this happen. So thank you so much for your in attention and interest, and I can now try and answer any questions you might have. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Peng. That was really, um, really informative. And um, I agree with your your following list of Twitter. Um, <laughs> we were muted, but I, I thought that was great. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to invite everybody now to um, go ahead and type in any other questions that you have. We'll get started with the first few. Um, but now is the time to submit your questions through the, through the question window, if you have any. Um, so just to start us off, one of the first questions um, is, what um, questions and considerations would you advise a parent to ask or to be aware of um, when working with their medical team to determine um, when and if a VAD is needed? Um, so really just to look at empowering parents with what kind of information they should be looking for. That's such a good question. So I think it really does come down to quality of life. And our goal as heart failure doctors is to provide the therapy that patients need to maintain a, a good quality of life, whether that be using some diuretics, using IV medications, or if the heart failure is severe enough, uh, considering a mechanical heart pump to get them to a place where they are compensated and feeling better. So, Really focusing on patient symptoms is important and uh, just seeing if your kids are feeling better or worse with their therapies and kind of their, uh, their trajectory with that. Also, it is important to, um, with, with children with heart, heart failure, it's important to keep a close eye on end organ function, such as kidney and liver function. If kidney and liver function starts to decline, it may be a sign that their current medical therapies are not um, working hard enough for, for the patient. And that is often a time when mechanical support should be considered. Lastly, it's, it's crucial to keep close follow-up with their pediatric heart failure cardiologist, as just frequent check-ins can help you stay proactive and on top of it. As I mentioned, early consideration, staying in good shape, even pre-VAD is important for good outcomes post-VAD. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this next question is, <clears throat> excuse me, sort of a logistical question. Um, if a child um, is uh, looking at being discharged with a VAD um, and they don't live nearby their, their treating center, um, are they still eligible to be discharged or would they need to, be, to stay nearby their hospital? Um, how frequently would the, uh, the VAD patients be monitored after being discharged? That's a great question, and it's uh, definitely an issue that we wrestle with here in Michigan because we have a big state as well. In general, we, we do not want to send any patients home that aren't stable, but if we are able to get to a point where the child is well compensated, well supported on a bed without major complications, we feel pretty good about the therapy, and we'll have patients living you know, four or more hours away as long as they are reasonably close to uh, a decent emergency room. Interestingly, by the time you're ready for discharge, the parent and the patient is often the most, uh, the, the most knowledgeable about pediatric VADs than anyone in a hospital or emergency room. <laughs> so the, the parent and the patient should be able to monitor for any signs that things aren't going the right way. In terms of follow-up, typically, initially, it will be pretty frequently, at least you know, once a week or a couple times a month. But hopefully, with stability, you can space that out to every month or even quarterly. Um, and some patients 
can be seen, you know, uh, a couple of times a year. In pediatrics, there are some patients that have lived with their uh, device for over five years in adults using older technology. Some adults have lived with their device for over a decade. And with this newer technology, like with the HeartMate 3 and the HFAD, we hope that they can continue to be very durable therapies that can be managed as outpatients for a long period of time. But it does depend on uh, kind of center preference. Some centers may want you to stay close to the hospital after implant for maybe a month or two to make sure there is stability and then kind of uh, liberalize from there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question here is, uh, you talked about cardiomyopathy, but can you um, briefly mention how frequently VADs are used for um, children with congenital heart disease? That's such a good question. In general, um, maybe about a, a little less than a quarter of patients with congenital heart disease are needing some type of mechanical uh, circulatory support or VAD to get them to transplant. Due to their previous surgeries, complex anatomy, reconstructions that are necessary, um, it makes them more challenging to support with a VAD. But we are, and we are getting better at supporting patients with complex congenital heart disease um, with VADs. I didn't show this slide, but for instance, Fontan patients single ventricle patients uh, that have gone through the three stages of palliation, they are actually good candidates for VADs if they primarily have pump uh, or heart failure, systolic dysfunction. Their outcomes are equivalent to adults without congenital heart disease if the indication is kind of ventricular dysfunction. So this is also an area of great interest uh, within our learning collaborative to better support patients with congenital heart disease and share best practices on what works and what doesn't work. Great, thank you. Another question is, um, is it more difficult to utilize a VAD than uh, using ECMO? That's, uh, that's a great question. So previously, we used ECMO as a bridge to transplant when uh, the waiting patient had just severe decompensated, uh, worsening heart failure. ECMO in general is a, is a absolutely necessary and brilliant temporary support system, but it is not a good long-term solution. With ECMO, as you know, there is lots of inflammation, lots of moving inflammation, lots of moving parts, and kids generally don't do well on ECMO for longer than a, a couple weeks. And as I mentioned, there are um, waiting, waiting lists and waiting times are getting longer and longer. And if children are expected to wait months to even a year or more on the waiting uh, list, ECMO is not a viable solution for that. We also know that because of just the complications and the inflammation uh, that ECMO causes, bridging directly from ECMO to transplant is associated with, with worse post-transplant survival. We don't see that same effect uh, when you bridge from ECMO stably to a VAD, then get transplanted. Those patients do pretty well, but going directly from ECMO to a new transplanted heart, there's something about ECMO that makes the outcomes worse. Okay, thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, about biventricular pacemakers? Can you comment on those? That is a great uh, question, and I'm all for that, especially if there is a clear indication. I'm assuming that uh, this patient probably has some dyssynchrony or uncoordinated squeeze of the heart, and in adult heart failure. It's actually a class one, highly recommended um, therapy that if a patient has poor function, a wide QRS and dyskinetic heart, to use pacemakers to kind of synchronize, sync up the heart to squeeze better. In certain patients, this may help stave off the need for a VAD 
or transplant. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question is, um, can you talk a little bit about um, any types of uh, developments as far as new, new types of devices being developed uh, that may be coming in the future? Yes. So the Jarvik 2015, the, the last uh, kind of small VAD that I showed, that is, uh, I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen. Yes, we can see um, okay. the, the last slide is the one that's displayed right now. But yeah, there you go. Yeah. So there is actually a trial going on, a single arm trial, where um, we are testing the safety and feasibility of this Jarvik 2015. It's a it's an axial flow implantable small VAD, almost like a boat propeller that um, that initially seems to have um, reasonable outcomes, and we're still figuring out the safety of these devices. So that's probably the thing that is closest to being used clinically uh, widespread. Okay. But we know that um, in general there aren't. Because there are limitations to how small the vats can get due to um, hemolysis or breakdown of the red blood cells and overheating of the vat itself. So we are trying to improve our management and care and kind of adaptation of adult devices for children. And we do think that we can make considerable improvements just by improving how we use and manage these devices. So our network is obviously hoping for newer devices coming down the pike, but in the meantime, we're doing everything we can to um, improve our care with the current devices. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's one last question and uh, for now, so if anybody has any other questions that you wanted to submit, um, please go ahead and do so at this time. Um, the last question is um, just, do you have any comments on, um, uh, the different types of VADs, are they, are, is, are there different types that are more um, uh, eligible for the patients to be discharged and, and last longer as far as endurance, or um, are they all, uh, are there any factors related to that, um, depending on the type of VAD? Yes. So, the, the, uh, the adult devices do have the most data and experience behind them. Um, but obviously, you have to be large enough to be able to fit one of these adult devices in. Uh, so they, they can be used in patients that are generally greater than 30 pounds or 15 kilos. And the HeartMate 3 is the, uh, the newest device. And this device is interesting because it can, um, the, the spinning uh, impeller, the spinning portion is magnetically levitated, sort of like a, a Japanese high-speed train so that there's no friction. We believe based on uh, early preliminary data that this is more uh, quote unquote hemocompatible or less prone to clotting than uh, older devices. However, the HeartMate 3 is slightly bulkier and is generally can only fit in patients that are bigger uh, with maybe uh, bigger than 30 kilos and with a body surface area greater than one. The heart where HVAD and the HeartMate 3 can both be discharged home if, uh, if the course post uh, that has been relatively uncomplicated. So these these two devices are probably the most uh, tried and true currently that we can implant in kids and get home safely. But obviously, um, not uh, if you're smaller than uh, 30 pounds, you can't squeeze one of these devices in. So we are uh, continuing to um, try to improve care with the Berlin Heart X Core. The Berlin Heart X Core is actually the only FDA approved device for use in children, and we have the most experience with uh, Berlin Heart X Core in small children. We have started using uh, newer anticoagulation strategies, and I think that is directly leading to better pump function and less stroke risk 
than what has been previously reported. However, with the Berlin Heart X score, you, you cannot leave the hospital. Um, you see this is a massive driver um, uh, that is attached to the, the pump in the patient. Berlin Heart is trying to make this smaller and potentially portable, but at this point in time, um, patients need to be closely monitored and supported in the hospital while waiting with uh, this device. The, um, the last one that we uh, mentioned, the Jarvik 2015, that one is fully implantable and it's almost like a miniaturized adult device. It's still too early to tell, but potentially these patients with the Jarvik 2015 may be able to be discharged home. And these could fit in smaller patients. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, well, I just wanted to take uh, another minute to um, to thank you so much for joining us and um, sharing your time and expertise with our with our attendees today. So, thank you, Dr. Peng. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your attention and this opportunity to meet with you all. Thank you so much. Um, just a reminder um, that. Um, it, this is National Pediatric Transplant Week, and so um, we are doing another webinar tomorrow um, in support of that week on emotional considerations for transplant families. Um, and we also, um, Melissa, um, I don't know if you want to hop back on and, and share any other final thoughts, but Melissa's webpage uh, for transplant families also has um, some great resources about, um, about the week, and I don't know if... Uh, Melissa, sorry, I think you might be muted. So let me just give you, um, sorry, let me unmute you if you wanted to have any any other final thoughts. Just one, I just wanna encourage everyone out there to share their inspirational stories of survival with hashtag Kids Transplant Week. We wanna hear all the wonderful stories that you have to share. And I wanna thank everyone for this opportunity today. Um, it's been a wonderful webinar. I agree. Thank you so much again, everybody. This session um, is being recorded and we'll uh, get it posted on our YouTube channel um, on CCF. So um, if you wanted to refer back to it or share it with anybody that wasn't able to attend in live time, um, that will be available for you and we'll send out an email with that information when it's posted. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.